Well, a very good morning. Welcome back to Pyeongchang, the third of three pre-Olympic World Cup races. I do beg your pardon. And, uh, of course, we've joined it a little bit late with the luge overrunning. And that means uh, we're now into the final of the women's team sprint. Two in a team, and they're doing six times 1.4. So each athlete does uh, three laps of the 1.4 kilometer course. They're getting fairly familiar with it, having had a sprint uh, here before. And uh, interesting situation developing. I can tell you that the uh, Norwegians and the USA won the two semi-finals. But at the moment, it's the greatest rivalry in cross-country skiing, Sweden versus Norway. And the Swedes love to beat the Norwegians more than anyone else. And at the moment, they have a slim lead. Well, very good skiing by Molin and Nordstrom of Sweden to uh, keep themselves in the running. 20 minutes on the clock at the moment, and uh, Sweden take the win, 20.37. Norway didn't really have a response to that. The Americans could get themselves another podium finish. They've had two already this week. Uh, good racing, racing from them. Elizabeth Stephen getting on the uh, podium, of course, and uh, Ida Sargent also getting a taste of uh, the top three. But Sweden, 2037. Uh, I was going to say it's a Norwegian B team, but actually I think we can probably go down as far as C or D uh, with the number of top women that they've left behind training for the World Championships in Lati. And uh, Norway two across the line in six. The Slovenians, I think they'll be happy, Mike. They've not had a bad weekend. Viznar and Lampitz both doing well. They, they have done very well. And of course, uh, day one of the sprints, uh, good uh, results there, without a doubt, for the Slovenian team. And Petra Majic really has given the future of sprinting in Slovenia so much confidence, so much belief. I thought the American teams, though, third and fourth there. Very tight, very close on the track. Yeah, good strength in depth. That's got to be good news for their challenge. Of course, the Americans did really well at the last Worlds in Farland 2015. They'll be expecting more medals. Are they going to do as well? I th you know, there was an element of luck, let's say, involved in Farland with the change of conditions during the women's races. But they really are realistic contenders. Uh, for the women's relay, certainly, for the, for the men's, do they, do they have a chance in the men's race or are we looking at the Canadians for the team sprint? Well, do you know, I, I think because the Canadians have, pr have shown that they can medal in both sprint and in relay, uh, I, think that, uh, I think that the Americans will, will feel the same confidence crossing over. The North American teams seem to push each other on, so uh, it's not impossible. <laughs> Look how happy the American teams are. It's outstanding. It, it is a World Cup. Albeit a lot of the top names not uh, not pitching up here. Yeah, of course, Lampitz getting her first ever World Cup win out here. Um, yes, we have to consider how many names are missing, but you also have to remember what it does to win a World Cup. Not only do you feel great, but your sponsors feel fantastic. Uh, let's have confirmation. 20.37.11, the winning time from Sweden 1, ahead of Norway 1, United States in third and fourth, uh, and uh, fairly tightly packed there. And... Uh, the ladies' final decided uh, with a good victory by the Swedes and the snow starting to thicken here in Pyeongchang. This could cause a few problems for the men's who are ready to go in their final. Yeah, but there's no camera behind it. You're clear. Now, just a couple of minutes to go before the final race from these pre-Olympic races. Pyeongchang, of course, the host of the Olympic Games next year. And we've certainly learned a lot from the races over the last four days. The sprint course is brutal, no doubt about that. Quite difficult to get a hold of the skiathlon course, Mike. A lot of it in the open meadows, lots of loops, twists, turns, plenty of opportunity to see where the opposition are. Uh, be interesting to hear what the athletes think, how much they've learned, how much they've benefited from coming all the way out here. And, and I guess how much those who haven't come have missed. Well, I think you miss a lot. And, and just to feel the stadium, to feel the tracks, uh, it does amaze me why we haven't seen that. I know it's because of the World Championships, but even so, I think I, would, I was surprised that some of the big names didn't just get a feel for this venue. And the tracks, uh, certainly Kowalczuk yesterday saying they're extremely testing, as, as tough as she's ever raced on in terms of sprint racing. 
And uh, what we can see on the screen is the strong headwind, which she talked about uh, in an interview in the Polish newspapers yesterday. And I think Kowalczyk will... Uh I believe she's headed to Sochi for a little bit of uh, pre-worlds training or maybe there's a financial deal there, I'm not sure. Uh, I think she'll be very confident that next year she can come and do some damage on this sprint course. It will be a classic sprint, suits her down to the ground and the last climb is so steep that you know she will be the quickest up it if she's in shape. The question is, w between now and then, will she learn to go around the corners at high speed? Because if she doesn't, I don't think she can win. Well, it's such a well. Let's hope that she that she will put those uh, the easier aspects of her game to improve the, those small margins. And if she does, I'm sure she could win here again next year. Anyway, let's focus on the race. We've got the United States wearing bib number two. Andrew Newell te teamed up with uh, Simeon Hamilton. Both of them have been racing well out here. France with Baptiste Gros and Lucas Shanova. That's a competitive uh, team, certainly, in this team sprint. Just a reminder, it's uh, six by 1.5 kilometers. Danny Stock, Rundgren, if you were with us yesterday, they both finished on the podium in the ski athlon. How much have they got left? I'm not sure. Well, it's a brave effort uh, to come out again today in the team sprint. Oh yes, Sivu and Vurinen for Finland. Parfenov and Retivik. You know, for, for those on Patrick, there's a lot of these athletes who did race yesterday, but uh, at least they can buy themselves some comfort in the fact that it's just 1.4 k's maximum and then the same amount of time resting while their teammate goes round the same course. Yeah, surely Team 4 Russia have to be the favourites because in the individual sprint, they finished first and third. Resvik took the win. Parfenov finished in third just behind Sondra Fosley of Norway. The Norwegians, though, wear the red bib because they've been leading the uh, relay standings this year. And uh, their hopes pinned on Danny Stock and Matty Rundgren. I guess, Mike, they're two endurance specialists. Do you consider this closer to an endurance race or closer to a sprint race? I think because it's uh, you're doing this track three times, I think it's more uh, an endurance. Yes, you have to have a lot of strength, a lot of fast twitch fibers to make sure you have the speed, but because you're doing it three times consecutively, or, or should I say with the same amount of rest as you are working, it's definitely more in, into the endurance. Well, here's the first climb, and uh, in the classic style, this was most of the athletes were double polling the first half and then switching into the two phase. So we've got uh, two of the Russian teams up the front. And uh, it's Norway 1 leading the way at the moment. Danny Stock on the far side, tucked in behind him, is Baptiste Gro of France, who's teamed up with Lucas Shanovat today. And the Russians, uh, Team 5 coming up over the top. That is uh, Artem Maltsev, who's... Uh, Slightly exceeded expectations over the first 800 metres. Andre Parfenov, though, comfortably sitting in four at the moment. The Americans dropping to the back, looking for the Canadian suit, the red and white. Canada with Jesse Cockney, Len Valius taking leg number two. Of course, Len Valius, part of the team that won the team sprint in Dobiaco just a couple of weeks ago. And a strong, I think this is a strong Canadian team again with uh, Jesse Cockney now out on track. We've just been over the little bit of extra, the 100 metres extra ski on the track compared to the women's who did 1.4. This is a 1.5 kilometre track for the men. I have a feeling the French team here uh, could be a threat to, on paper, maybe the strongest, the Russian team. Russia wearing bib number four, Russia's first team, that is, with Parfenov and Retivik. Uh, Danny Stock hasn't held back on this first lap. He's uh, He's got another two to go after this. So the man from Vadso Ski Club uh, certainly laying down the law here, and he strung the field out dramatically. Well, I think the two Norwegians, Mike, uh, as we said, both on the podium in the endurance race over 30 k's yesterday, I think they've decided their only way of getting on the podium is to push the pace from the gun. They don't want to get involved in a sprint because they'd be left standing. Well, it's an interesting 
I thought it might be a little slow. This first uh, 1.5 kilometers, I thought it might be just everybody feeling their legs, feeling what it's like to sprint after the 30k yesterday. But it's been it's been full pace. This is is like an interval session, really, isn't it, Mike? They're going to have just over three minutes on, just over three minutes off. Uh, it's a fairly brutal interval session. This but they've already done the semi-finals, so there's a lot of skiing in the legs already. Krukov now, uh, that's not a good changeover for the Russians. In fact, I think it was almost deliberate. He doesn't want to take the lead. No, Norway quite happy to take it on. And uh, that might be a mistake in the long run. Matty Rundgren, uh, the Norwegians though, happy to keep the pace high. I would be very, very surprised if uh, Rundgren slows it down. No, he's happy to lead. Beautiful flowing style of his. Just behind him, that's Russia too with Nikita Kriakov, who uh, came to notice in Vancouver in 2010. The Russians totally dominant in the classic sprints in the 2010 Olympic Games. Haven't quite had it the same way since then. Team 12, that's France 1 with Lucas Chanabar now having taken over from Baptiste Gro. And then the danger team, certainly Russia 1 with uh, Gleb Retivik down in fourth, just ahead of Sweden. I think it's fair to say that Rune Green, uh, his freestyle skiing, his skating, is, is slightly more efficient than we saw him yesterday in the Classic, the first 15 kilometers yesterday. As the race went on, he seemed very tired. Look at this, Patrick, still nothing in it. What, two or three seconds separating the first seven, eight teams? But those behind, as soon as the gaps start opening, it's so hard to close them down and demoralizing further back. Are you going to lay down the podium finishers at this stage? Well, I don't know why, but I just feel good about France. So I'll go for France, and I'll go for one of the two Russian teams. And uh, Canada, well, I think, will fight for a podium alongside Norway's second team. Well, I'll go for Russia 1 on the podium. I'll go for USA on the podium. Hamilton and Newell's a strong-looking team, provided they can stay there. And uh, I think Norway are going to get raced out of it, so uh, I'll put France on there as well. Well, yeah, you're, you're on to something there. Of course, the Norwegians have done all three days of racing, and uh, that is a tough task. But it's still a long way to run. What I noticed uh, in the sprints two days ago, the French team in qualifying, they had a third and a seventh, and then dropped back quite significantly in the, as they, they, they progressed. This is a big, big climb. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the tactics are. Those who head home will have uh, created some sort of idea in the mind as we see uh, Belarus going over the top with uh, Mikhail Kiklin. Um, that climb, Mike, that's where Kowalczyk's obviously going to try and make her move, but you really want to be in second place at that stage because you have this long, sweeping right-hand turn. You want a clean entry into the last little rise, which is coming up now. And now this is the part of the course that reminds me very much of Val Muster, where you have a sort of sweeping left-hand turn into the finishing straight, which is what it will be on the final leg. So, handover number two. Both men completing one 1.5-kilometre loop. They've both got two still to go. Norway one still there. Will Danny Stock take the pace this time? He's not going to get a choice because France, with Baptiste Gro have uh, taken the lead. And now the Russians starting to uh, turn up the pace as well. 15 seconds, uh, the Canadians are behind. Lent Valius, I think, is exhausted. He's had a really busy week. Um, yeah, I wonder what his preparation is going to be for the for the World Championships. Mike, uh, we, we were talking about Kowalczyk going to Sochi. Obviously, the track's there at around 1,600 metres. Do you need to go to altitude to race somewhere like Lati, which is at about, what, four, 500? I, I think it's a big benefit, I really do, because you're changing just while you're training, and Sochi's only, what, 1,500 metres, it's not extreme altitude, so you're still able to do your tempo, your limb speed is still going to be good, but you're living, eating, sleeping there, and you're, you're gaining the red blood cells, which uh, would cer certainly help you at lower altitudes. The key is, obviously, don't overdo it. Uh, overtraining at this stage would would ruin your chances. And, and you know, I'm just thinking about Kowalczyk going there. Uh, over the years, she's she's tended to overdo it. She's so focused, over push her training. I hope she doesn't, and I hope she is strong 
in Lati for the title, the 10 kilometer. Yeah, it'd be lovely to see her training program for the next two weeks. I'm just looking here, as you said, Canada, the, Canada's first team, 15 seconds. That's too much to lose at this stage. And also the German team, 13 seconds behind. Yeah, we haven't mentioned them. Thomas Vick and Andy Kuhn on course for the German team. They both raced yesterday, finished 11th and 13th respectively. So not bad uh, racing at all from them. But still, it's Team 4, Russia 1, that really should be able to this, win this one with relative ease. And at the moment, Russia 1 not offering to do any of the work. They're just tracking everyone else. And you can see uh, on course for them at the moment is Andrei Parfenov, who comes from uh, Rochev's club. This is a, a brutal course. Uh, continually, these steep climbs. Yes, you get recovery, but it's quick recovery. And you need to keep your legs working around the recovery phases. So yes, your breathing's recovering, but your legs are not. The waxing is going to be so important in the Olympic Games next year on that sort of a steepness of a climb. Do you want a ski that you can go straight up in the track, or do you want a ski that's lightly waxed so you've got good speed down the home straight? Oh, you're needing great speed down here. Uh, and I was just wondering, I wonder what Peter Nordic's thinking right now. What is my best line into this finish? I think he'd opt for a second or third position along this part. The third of six legs about to come to an end and the French uh, still looking comfortable. They've led the way on this course. Uh, Lucas Chanavan now has the choice. He could lead the way out or he could tuck in behind the rest. I think you're far better off at this stage. They've split it down to just six teams. You might as well get towed along. Chanavan's not interested in leading. Russia too, uh, almost forced into the lead at the moment, but Norway trying to keep the pace high, and Matty Rundgren working his way to the front again. He's got to keep them hurting. What he's trying to do is race the sprint out of the legs of the Russians. Well, he realised that uh, the pace had definitely slowed down on the previous lap. Yes, it, there was still a separation at the front, but I think it plays into Norway's hand to keep this strong to keep as many teams and I think Sweden just suffering at the moment at the back. Well, I'm glad I put a little bit of money on the Americans to do well here because they're looking very comfortable. Simeon Hamilton there sitting in about fifth place. He's been well sheltered from the uh, wind and, and a few of the athletes might mentioning that it's very exposed particularly on those endurance races. If there's a puff of wind, you're going to feel it. And that's a key factor for the races because it makes the, ta the the pursuits and the mass start so tactical. So much so, and uh, I'm surprised Rune Green uh, took the strong man option <laughs> to go to the front. Yeah, into, into a slight headwind on this particular section. But uh, I, I, I do like your call there, the American team with that. Great to see Andrew Newell two days ago, but it was classic, uh, coming sixth in the sprint. Neither of us have backed the Swedes, uh, but they're still there. Sitting at the back of this group of six teams, we've got Norway 1, France 1, Russia 1 and 2, USA back in fifth position, and then Sweden wearing bib number three at the back. You'll surely recognise the Swedish colours by now. And that's Gustav Eriksson, who comes from uh, Falun. So he's, uh, he's a man who's already raced at home this year. I was impressed by the races there in Farland, the 30k and, and the sprint. The sprint course is tremendous. I think it's one of the best, although this, we don't really get perspective because uh, it's all quite open here, but this is a, a very good and testing course, but not quite so spectator friendly in the stadium. Yeah, I, I think that the, the problem is you don't have that, what? It's almost a full minute you get. The last minute of the sprint is in the stadium in Farland. That's crucial for building the climax. And you've got that long, long descent, the back straight. It's very gradual, but so many tactical moves are made there. My only criticism of this course is that the finish isn't long enough and it's not hard enough. I would love to see another 200, maybe 300 metres into that home straight because there's, the medals are going to be won in that home straight, obviously, without a doubt, but it, it gives more of a chase down. Yeah, I agree. Uh, an extra hundred would do, provided you put a little uphill stint on the last 50 metres to really sort out those who'd gone too early. And that's a, that's what Falun has as well, that little rise up to the finish line. Well, are we starting to see some developments here? There's a little break, and it's down to the Norwegians. Maddie Rundgren has once again pushed the pace. The French having no problem staying with it. Lucas Chanavar is there, looking comfortable. 
Now, Rundgren has got to hope that Danny Stock's got something left in the tank because this is a 10-meter lead that they do not want to throw away. It's uh, pretty much knocked the Swedish off the back of the group. Gustav Eriksson couldn't stay with it. Robert Noren now for Sweden has got some work to do. And away goes... Uh, oh, Danny what? Stock. That was a terrible handover. He lost uh, two seconds there. He lost everything that Rundgren had gained. Yeah. But, you just, I'd, I'd love to have a mic on Rundgren right now because that is, it's its criminal to make those sort of mistakes and it's given France an opportunity, will they take it? Bapti Gro has an option now. Look at this, what on earth was going on there? He was about to start his race and he turned left. Very strange. Extraordinary. Yeah, half asleep. <laughs> <laughs> At least he was in the start area. We've had occasions where the next runner hasn't even been present in the exchange box. Let's have another look at this. So he's double pulling, he's happy, and then he snow plows and stops when his teammate's coming in. Oh, he left, right. he left the exit zone. You've got a handover within the changeover zone, so I wonder if that's a DQ. I think that's why he stopped. Why else would you stop? He's saying, oops, the coach is saying, hope, hope it hasn't been noticed. So you've got to hand over it within that 30 meter zone. Yeah, well, he was asleep either way. Well, they're going to continue racing and uh, we'll get a verdict on that. To be honest, what we're not 100% sure is whether that was the, uh, the start of the box or the finish. The French were very close as well. So uh, we could do with seeing that again we, a little bit later on. Especially in this, the team event, we've often said a wish that they would make that, that changeover zone longer and wider because you've got 15 teams trying to figure things out and so often it disadvantages a, a leading team. But the race is still on. Two Russian teams in there. The Norwegians are a bit shaken now. France looking strong. Good move coming in from Russia 1. Is this Andrei Parfenov starting to make a move he's uh, come up on the right hand side of Baptiste Grow of France just one leg to go after this but uh, to be honest the Russian is working 100% he might lose a little bit of time in the closing stages and the Norwegians are not only disqualified they were out of the box well spotted Mike so Daniel Stock uh, wow. has made a drastic mistake their chance of uh, getting the money that's uh, that's a bad mistake in terms of World Cup points and finances for the Norwegian duo and uh, it means that Matty Rundgren can uh, ski away from the start. He will not take part on the final leg. So we're down to three. Unbelievable. You've got to, you, your athletes have got to know what they're doing. As an athlete, you've got to know what you're doing. And that's really surprising to make a, a very, very elementary error. Row of France. He's, uh, he's trying to get a couple of metres. What's most important now is that he gets a clean exchange. Gives Lucas Shanova an option of taking the lead or tucking in behind the Russians. He might be better to tuck in at this stage, but uh, we've already seen Lucas Shanova do a lot of work on the second round of this 1.5 kilometre loop. Shanova's not interested in leading. Russia 2 don't want to lead. Russia 1 don't want to lead. We have a game of cat and mouse, and uh, well, I'm slightly su surprised to see... Uh, Matty Rundgren going again, but uh, I suppose he's disqualified. He might as well get in the mix. He could well close down on the leaders if they keep the pace as slow as this. And it's quite serious to lose uh, so many World Cup points. Uh, all important at the end of the season for nation standings, and this will do Russia a lot of good. Kuklin leading. Chanevara France in second. The danger man, Gleb. Redivik, who won the individual sprint three days ago, sitting in third, just ahead of Norway, who've been disqualified, but Rundgren is uh, on his way. <laughs> Looks like that well, early sprint has uh, worn him out. I wonder if Rundgren has been told, yes, get on with it, we'll try and uh, we'll try and question it later, we'll try and appeal later, and maybe, just maybe, there's a slim chance of them uh, being reinstated. Doubtful. Their only argument can be that the line was covered in snow, but we could see it, therefore he could see it. So I don't think that will stand.
Redovic hugely confident. You have to remember that his individual sprint was in the classic style, so uh, Shanova certainly better at freestyle than he is at classic, so that doesn't mean that it's a uh, foregone conclusion that Russia are going to win this one. One more big climb to come, and then the long, long descent. This is a, a cracking opportunity to see what the tactics should be come the Olympic Games next year. Will it be the race leader? I suspect the race leader at the top of the climb will not win this one. Shanova's gone early. He's lost his nerve. He's got a long climb, and then the pitch steepens dramatically at the end. Under the banner. Well, that's, that's so impressive, Patrick, to be skate to double dancing out there. That is pure strength but it's got him some kind of a game. He needs 20 meters. He needs to break the slipstream. And uh, if he can keep the pace going, he could just do it, but he's starting to tire now. Shanova went too early. That's the trouble with skate two. Your, your lactic acid boils in your body. And you don't quite get as much uh, recovery through your legs. Okay, so the athletes will learn. Do not start your sprints at the bottom of the final climb. Wait until you're at least halfway up, because now the advantage switches to Russia one. And Gleb Redivik it is who suddenly makes his move, he goes past the Frenchman. Well, that could be useful, that might be a mistake, unless he can get some 10 metres clear. One little climb to come, and then they have the left-handed turn into the finish. Redvik still looking the stronger of the two athletes out front. I'm not sure that uh, Nikita Kriakov, the Olympic champion from 2010, is going to play any part in the final stages. Let's watch this line. Shanovi could come on a little slingshot move here. I think he will. That's what he's going for, and he's carried good speed into the start of the home straight. Another 50 metres to go. Retivik just ups the tempo a little, still holding his own. Wow. The Frenchman can't quite do it. The length of leg had nothing to do with it on this occasion. <laughs> Well, a lot, of, a lot of learning there for the Olympics next year. Yeah, you are there to be shot at if you lead into the home straight. And I think if Shanova hadn't put that big burst in at the bottom of the big climb, he would have been in a position to win this one. So, so much to learn, as you say. Well, it's such a brutally steep hill to make the break there. Maybe was a good idea, but uh, he ran out of he ran out of strength by the top of the hill. Great race. Great race, shame that Norway uh, ran themselves out of it uh, by getting disqualified on that fourth exchange. The United States didn't quite come up with the goods, 24 seconds behind. And Finland, 34.5. Uh, the Finns, we never really saw them at the races, but uh, they'll be happy with fifth place. And Sweden started well, half distance they were still there, but Ericsson with his fifth position yesterday, he looked exhausted yesterday, he was exhausted today. But you have to say that Norway won really shaped that race, although they won't have a place on the result sheet. They were the ones that decided to go hard from the start so often. And in Toblak, when we were racing there, the first three or four legs are pedestrian. And then it starts. Well, that's it. They pushed the pace so hard, it really separated everybody. But I, often when you... You know, when your body clock is very different, it's 8 o'clock at night here in Pyeongchang, you've done the, the long flight out, it's not, they're not thinking straight to ski, to change over outside the changeover box, it's just such a, a silly mistake to make. Well, I wonder how many of these athletes are going to find themselves called up for the World Championships, having shown good form here. Uh, the Russians will certainly be interested in the racing that Parfenov, particularly Retovic, has shown over the last couple of days. Yes, he's, uh, he's showing top-class racing. And uh, I think he would stand in the best field at the World Championships. He'd stand there and have a real chance. Credit to Shanova, Mike. He, he obviously had a race plan turned out to be the wrong one but uh, <laughs> it's a brave move to go with what a minute 25 minute 25 minute 30 still to go for the finish uh, and he went for a monster sprint at the bottom bottom of the big climb do you think it would have been a different outcome if he'd waited until halfway up I think it would have and, and I think even if he'd not if he hadn't gone at all so early I think he could have come off that slingshot and still taken the victory without that that crazy push up the, the final steep climb taken out of his legs. Yeah, there is also the chance that uh, had he not gone, Retovic of uh, Russia might have decided to go early, so we, we, we can only speculate, but it was a brave move, one that I don't think we'll see him doing again, and that skate too, as you say, really does pump up the lactate. But you know when you're fatigued, you've got all this fatigue in your body, and then you pump, it's like pushing heavy, heavy weights at speed, you, you don't come back from that quickly.
Yeah, and, and I've always found on a climb, if you start skate two and then break into skate one, you feel awful. If you've <laughs> yes. gone, you only have to go sort of 10, 15 metres too far with the skate one. Exactly. With the skate two before you break into the skate one. Norway's team two didn't start and team one disqualified. Bad day for Norway. Great race though. Sweden winning the women's. Russia taking victory in the men's team sprint. Welcome back to Pyeongchang. Just uh, look at the Team Cup standings for the women. Norway well, well ahead. Almost uh, twice as many points as anyone else. And I can't see that changing before the end of the season. Uh, further down, any teams coming up, Mike? The Czech Republic, you'd expect to be a little bit better. Kazakhstan, we've seen them doing great things out in Almaty at the University Games. Maybe in a couple of years' time, they'll start to move into the top 10. Yeah, and interestingly, Australia up there in the top 30, uh, getting points because maybe because of the lack of attendance here in Pyeongchang from the other nations. But overall, are you impressed with the setup? I know we haven't got as many spectators as we're going to have next year. The racing's been fantastic. I think it has, and these track profiles, all the athletes saying they're very challenging. You'd expect that for Olympic tracks uh, and very technical. So they, you know, it gives many coaches many aspects to work on and prepare their teams for the Olympic Games especially this important finish straight. The two American teams having a good sprint for third position in the women. Sweden taking the day, just as they did in Sochi back in 2014. A little reminder to the Norwegians that they are beatable. I know their big names aren't here, but the victory still counts. Okay. Wait, what, what? Well, a lot of the teams will be heading back to Europe tomorrow morning and uh, many focusing on preparation for the World Championships. I think there'll be a team debrief for all of them when they get back just to find out what it was like, what the you snow conditions now. are like, what the food is like. Uh, so many questions from the big names that aren't here. And I can't help thinking, Mike, that a number of the cross-country skiers will come out at the end of the season just to look at the tracks, just to get some idea of what they've got to prepare themselves for. Because between now and the, the Olympic Games, they want to be thinking of these tracks every single night. I think it's so important to have that, carry that feeling uh, in your training and to have that in the back of your mind uh, on the task ahead. And this is the task ahead for all those aiming for medals or dreaming of medals in one year's time. Ladies and gentlemen, the flower ceremony for the Fisk Cross Country World Cup for the ladies team sprint free technique. 관중 여러분, 지금부터 FIS 크로스 컨트리 월드컵 여자 스프린트 단체전 꽃다발 시상식을 시작하겠습니다. In third place, Team USA won Sophie Caldwell and Ida Sargent. 먼저 3위 미국 1등입니다. They finished second in their semi-final behind the Norwegians. Caldwell and Sargent have had a very good week. Two podium places in a week for Ida Sargent. Svensson and Schlind. Schlind didn't have the best of days yesterday in the ski athlon over 15 kilometers, but she's got herself a medal today. Sweden won. and Maria Nordstrom. Beaten by Patterson and Stephen of. USA in the semi-finals, Molin and Nordstrom, very, very strong, great tactics from Maria Nordstrom on that last lap, showed good strength, led over the top of the hill, and still had something to give on that sprint finish. I think it's fair to say that the dress rehearsal for the 2018 Winter Olympics has gone pretty well as far as the cross-country races are concerned. The biathletes, of course, coming out here post the World Championships. 
I can't think of many big names who'll miss that opportunity. Oh, and it's a World Cup. It's important for the races, for the points for the season. And more, most importantly, it's to feel and see these tracks here. And even when, as a biathlete, it's even more important. You need your mindset uh, aware of how you approach the range, of how you get your breathing under control. Don't push too hard before you come in. And uh, it's all ideal to have a, a test race here. And I think that's where the International Biathlon Union have got it just right. Bring the athletes here after the main competition of the year, the World Championships. In fact, it's straight on the back of that, so no reprieve, no break after the World Champs. Almost straight on a flight and out here. So we go to Pyeongchang, then of course the biathletes go to Finland, Kontiolahti, and finish off in Oslo. Cross-country skiers, all the focus now is on Lati. She wanted two, she got one. Just looking at Sophie Caldwell there, of course, uh, in the Tour de Ski last year. I know it was a stage race, but she took her first uh, World Cup or stage win in the sprint in Toblach last uh, January. Was it not over stuff? Toblach, Toblach. Either way, she got a win. Yeah, it was definitely toe black, and uh, that inspired, I, I hope I'm right in saying that, that inspired uh, Jess Diggins to get the win in the five kilometre in toe black. Well, maybe I'm wrong. I see you've written down there. <laughs> we'll have to check that later. Lunch is on it. I'm quite sure it was toe black. <laughs> Good win for Sweden. Team Cup standings in the men. Once again, Norway, uh, a decent margin clear. Not quite as comfortable as their women. But uh, they head both the nation's uh, team cup standings. Russia certainly making some ground today, particularly with the disqualification. Great Britain down in 11th place. Uh, Andrew Young, Andrew Musgrave have done good work. I mean, that's, uh, that's a massive achievement. If they can make it into the top 10 by the end of this year, uh, it will take some uh, extraordinary results from Andrew Musgrave. Let's have a look at the end of the men's sprint. Russia were there to be shot at, but Shanover of France had already... Uh, Used his reserves on the final climb. Retvik just too strong. Only about 18 inches in it. But Russia won, getting yet another win. Well, there you see it was closer than 18 inches, closer to 12. And uh, Shanova wasn't far off. He did exactly the right thing, didn't he, Mike? He got that slingshot off the final corner. I thought he did everything right. And I was just thinking, they, they, I know it was only 18 minutes ago when the women came in, but the line that Reykjavik was on was where most of the women came down to home straight. And I think Shanova went into slightly newer snow. Uh, and uh, I think Reykjavik alluded to the fact that home straight was so slow in the recently fallen snow. But I'll tell you what, he had some desire to win. Reykjavik uh, coming in those last 10 metres, he was not going to let that win go easily. Two sprint races for Reykjavik this week, two wins. He looked comfortable in the classic sprint. Ladies and gentlemen, the flower ceremony for the fifth cross country World Cup men's team sprint in the free technique. In third place, Team Russia 2. Artem Maltsev and Nikita Krimkov. Kriakov, delighted to be back on a podium. Uh, it'd be nice to see him coming back to some sort of form for next year. I'm not sure he's get, got time for the World Championships in Lati this year, but he'll be focusing on the Olympic Games. Once you've tasted gold, you just want more. France in second place. Great racing from them. Perhaps the only mistake they made was to do some of the leading at the halfway stage. Yes, and then uh, that final climb, they'll be re reviewing that for next year at the Games coming here. So Parfenov and Vitivik 
showing great confidence. I think uh, they didn't take the lead until the top of the final climb of the final leg. You're right, they conserved so much energy along their journey. Well, that's all from Pyeongchang. The next time we see the cross-country skiers here, it will be the 2018 Winter Olympic Games. A lot to look forward to.